mural on the Sistine Chapel wall. So the Sistine Chapel that everyone's familiar with, with the ceiling and the creation of man and the seven days of creation, uh, this is on the wall behind the main altar is the Last Judgment. It's painted, I think, almost 20 years after he did the ceiling. And you can see Christ in the center here up in the heavenly glories. And then right next to him is Mary. And she's standing uh, to Christ's his right, and uh, that's where the wound is. You can't see it on this re reproduction, but where that soldier stabbed the side of Christ and the blood and water flowed out, that wounded side is on his right side, is what the, where Michelangelo's depicted it, and that's where Mary is. She's the bride of Christ. She's the church. You know, again, so now we can't say, you know, uh, you know we hate Mary, but we love Jesus Christ. Uh, we have the spirituality of Jesus, but we don't have the spirituality of Mary. That don't, that don't work that way. They're, the, they're one and the same, the bride and the groom. We talked about the husband and the wife on earth being that way. Uh, the two have become one flesh. That's why Michelangelo puts uh, Mary in that, uh, as the mother of God in that nimbus of Jesus, that whole halo that's going over not just his head but his whole body. She's encapsulated in that light of Christ, right? And then all these souls are being brought into heaven uh, through the power of the, the angels. There's one where the famously uh, the, the angel has the rosary and one of the souls is grabbed onto it and they're pulling it up into heaven by the rosary then. But all the angels are going down. This is purgatory on the right, uh, the left hand side of the image where the green is and over on the, the, where the blue is where the, uh, the river sticks and Chiron in the boat ferrying, he's ferrying the souls into, into hell that have slipped into hell. And these are angels that are coming, these uh, angels are coming to earth to bring the souls in purgatory up into heaven. And so they're getting their bodies. So you see bodies rising from the earth in Michelangelo's last judgment image. And then up in the clouds where Jesus and Mary are, are all the saints that have already risen to glory. They already have their... Uh, they're given their bodies at the same time we are then. Uh, you can see St. Peter with the keys and uh, St. Bartholomew with his skin dripping from him then. But uh, I, I just brought it because of that image of Mary being right next to the, the Christ because that f fits in with chapter 11 then with uh, Mary, Queen of the Angels. So she, this is really... Uh, if we just read that first paragraph, I think we get the, the summation of the chapter because she really spends more time talking about the angels and their importance than she does about Mary. But she says, uh, uh, you know, in the scriptures it says how Christ became lower than the angels for a time and then he's raised to glory when he, at his ascension and he becomes... Uh, he takes his rightful place at the, at the right hand of God. But it says, Christ is raised above the angels, for he is the incarnate word. He is the second person of the Trinity. Though he is true man, he's also true God. But for a time, when he was one person with these two natures, and he came to earth and was born, he came under the influence of the angels. And so there were, did Christ have a, a guardian angel? Well, we have a guardian angel because we have a body. Jesus had a human body. Jesus must have had a, an angel. Uh, because he's a priest and he's the perfect priest, uh, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about at your ordination day, the priest has a guardian angel from his conception. And then at your... Uh, at your ordination, you uh, receive a second angel. It's from a different choir. It's from the power choir. And that's the angel that helps you to affect the sacraments. He brings the graces. Remember Jacob's letter. He's, uh, and Jesus says to Bartholomew, uh, you know, I saw you under the fig tree. And he says, oh, truly you are the Son of God. And he says, do you believe I'm the Son of God because you saw, I said I saw you under the fig tree? You'll You'll believe I'm the Son of God because you'll see greater things than that. You'll see the angels of heaven ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so uh, that Eucharist that Bartholomew is going to be able to celebrate as a priest, uh, the, it's the angels that take the bread to heaven and bring back 
the body of Christ. It's the angels that take the wine of the Mass, the blood of Christ, and they bring back the blood of Christ. It's those angels continually ascending and descending on our altar is what Jesus is saying Bartholomew is going to have a, a vision of in the future when he's a priest. You'll see greater things than me seeing you under the fig tree. You'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man to bring the Eucharist into your hands that you celebrate as a priest. Right? And so uh, would we see those two angels in John's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel. I think it's the two. Uh, we see those two angels they are speaking to uh, Mary Magdalene when she bends down and looks into the tomb and she sees the two angels, one at the head and one at the feet of where the body of Jesus had been. And they tell her, what are you looking here for? He's risen. He's gone to the Father. You know, he's not here anymore. Go tell his disciples. And so Mary runs off. She sees those two angels of, that were Jesus' guardian angel and his priestly angel. She sees them at the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. Now, the other gospel, Matthew, only talks about there being one angel. But Luke and John, they talk about there being two. Mary Magdalene had the witness of the two. Because okay. uh, she goes into then uh, more about talking about how Mary is the queen of the angels. So she says, just like Christ, he's raised above the angels, but for a time when he was here on earth, angels ministered to him. And uh, remember they said he fasted for 40 days and then angels uh, ministered to him and, and brought him food after he's in the desert for the 40 days and tempted by Satan, remember? So we see these angels throughout scripture um, and he's under the power and the influence of other angels. So that's why the devil comes to Jesus and tempts him the three times because what's the devil doing? He knows he's not going to get the divine nature of Jesus Christ to sin because how can you sin against yourself? How can you deny the truth that you are God? But can Satan says, can I work on this human nature of the Christ to get him to sin? And so that's why the devil sees this is my only opportunity to get this unique thing that's both God and man to sin against God is to attack Jesus in his humanity. And so he gives them the three temptations, right? He's trying to work. So the Christ is under the power of angels, we could say, even though he is the one that created those angels. As God, in his one nature is that this divine, it says in our creed, and that's why we have to talk about this for RCIA. We have that one line in the creed, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Right there, when, God, when we say in the creed, he created the invisible things, that's where we're proclaiming the existence of angels. That who created those angels? God did. Remember, we had that problem. Uh, Mary's the mother of God, but we don't want to let people think that Mary originated before God. We can't have people thinking that angels existed before or at the same time as God. No. God is the creator of everything, both the visible and the invisible. So he created those angels that we can't see and that were over Christ for a period in his life. They, were, they had power over God. They tempted him to sin. And yet they're the creature tempting the creator. Yeah, but you know, you know, people do that all the time. What's that? Tempt the Lord. Uh, uh, put, well, him, put him to the test. Oh, yeah, yeah. Try to cut deals. Sure, sure. Uh, and that's just, that, that's a product of the creature, huh? So angels are no different than, than human beings, right? So uh, sin well, is are, that... They are, but yeah, they're different. The sin is that... Their wills and intellects can be... Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, is that sin is, is uh, saying that uh, uh, we want things our way instead of God's way. And so there were certain angels that said that too, and they sinned, they fell from grace. So the bad angels, they wanted things their way instead of God's way. 
and they sinned. That's what we do when we sin. Uh, God said, don't take that fruit. I want the fruit. So I take it. That's the sin. When we do something that God told us not to do, when we make what we want to be reality, what God has already defined as his reality, we want that to be different. That's what sin is. Huh. Okay. So she goes then into, you know, that in that line in the creed, that's where we proclaim the existence of angels. And she goes into the three primary things that we have to know about angels. Uh, this is on uh, chapter 11 on page 88, at the top of page 88. Uh, we have to know about their, uh, all their beauty proclaims the greatness of God. Uh, we have to know that we're living in the midst of a spiritual battle between the good angels versus the fallen angels, and that each of us has an angelic companion. And then she goes into the, the three hierarchies of angels, each containing three choirs. Let's see. So, uh, you got to know this, right? I think we've hit on this before, but... So she's ultimately getting to the point that... Uh, Mary, when she is assumed into heaven, that dogma that we talked about, or Pius the Twelfth and uh, told us, told us of in the in the document, when Mary uh, she ascends to Christ's right uh, to her spouse uh, Jesus Christ, which is her son. So this is weird stuff, right? Uh, she uh, is given. If Christ is the king of heaven, so God the Father is the king that makes Jesus, if he's the son, the king's son is king, and the son and the father in the, uh, the assumption of Mary are glorifying Mary, making her the queen of heaven. And so now Mary then has even the angels at her disposal. Even though she's under the... Uh, influence of angels just like the Christ was when she is, is assumed into heaven body and soul she becomes the queen of the angels so all the angels are underneath her and then there's the three choirs or, uh, the three hierarchies of angels and each hierarchy has three choirs to it and the choirs then become the job descriptions of the angels and so we have that sleeping cat's Think dogs, vicious, uh, purring pussy cats, acknowledge acclamation. So that's how we get the letters. So then it's the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones, dominions, virtues, powers, principalities. Archangels, and then your guardian angel. They just call them angels. And so uh, these three, the lowest hierarchy, spends all its time on earth. Though they continually behold God, even though they're here, they see God. And the second hierarchy it, uh, spends their time between heaven and earth. So those are those angels that Jacob saw going up and down the ladder. He had that vision, that dream. These are the types of angels he saw going up and down the ladder. And then these are the angels that spend, uh, first hierarchy, spend all their time in heaven. So there's this, you know, there's this image of the three keep coming out. There's three hierarchies. There's three choirs per each. And then each of these job descriptions. So what's the job of the angel, your guardian angel? When you, write, when you read your guardian angel prayer, that's your angel's function. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. That's, that's his job description. You just, you just read off his job description. But the archangels, all the angels are messengers. And so these archangels, they're different. They can take on, even though the angels are all pure spirit, that's why you can't see your guardian angel. He's invisible to you. He doesn't have physical matter to him. But the, all the angels are messengers. And there's an interesting thing about how uh, we can say that Jesus is like the angel par excellence because he's the Father's messenger. The Father sent him to earth with the message of 
How much do I love the human person? How much does God love you? Show him, Jesus, how much I love him. Okay, I'll carry a cross, I'll die on it, I'll rise from the dead for them. They'll see how much I love them. But Jesus, uh, the, one definition of Jesus is he's a messenger. He's a messenger of God. He's come from the Father and the Holy Spirit to tell us human beings how much we're loved. Right? But all these angels are messengers, and so these archangels, they have the uh, uh, obligation to bring messages directly from God to people, and they, can, they will take on the appearance of a human person. So Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, when they're interacting with Mary, when they're interacting with Tobit and Tobiah, we human beings, we see them in human form. And so, you know, what do they say in the Old Testament when there was an angel? A man of God came to me, they say. I knew it was an angel, but he looked like a man. And so they, in order to get their message so that it's not like the burning bush where you just hear the voice coming out of a bush with God, you see the voice coming out of something that you're, the human person can contemplate, uh, another human being, that's what the so these angels can take on, they don't, they never take on a body because it's anathema to them. So St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how they have the appearance of a man, but they don't, they can't take on flesh. It's just uh, they're given a gift from God to do that. Um, uh, I said this once before at a previous RCIA. I don't think you liked it, but my my idea. You think that, I will this time? <laughs> my, uh, I've developed. Maybe I'll like it. Well, <laughs> I uh, I've I've heard that before that the angels take on the appearance. Mm -hmm. So maybe they have such incredible intellects that they can organize matter, uh, like a hologram. Or See, they like can't that. create. Only God can create, and only humans creation. can create. It's, it's like taking dust and bringing it together, sort of like telepathy, or some power of intellect that can yeah. that can control matter. That's the mind of God. He can, he can only control. See them So the angels, but the thing is, they don't want. They don't. They think the body, human body, is an athlete. They see it as what it is. It's the same as dirt. And so the cosmologists tell us that these iron molecules that are at the center of every one of your red blood cells, and there's four of them that are in your hemoglobin molecule then, uh, uh, that originated in a star, in the core of a star that blew up millions and billions of years ago. And this, all, all we're made out of is stardust physical elements that God created. You know, God created the original hydrogen and helium molecules uh, of the Big Bang, but then all those other heavier metals that are in our body, they were created by the fusion of these smaller molecules together. And so the angels, they see, you're nothing but dirt. The same as the dirt on the ground. I, they don't even want to touch that. The only reason an angel and they can get the archangels to personify a body or take on a, a body in some form so that we can have it is because when the second person of the Trinity became man at a finite point in time, all of a sudden, now, they've never seen uh, something uh, take, the divine take on Particle, particulate matter. So you see all those Christmas cards that you get in the mail. All those angels, they're looking over Mary's shoulder and they're adorned. They're like, oh, look at Jesus, look at God. He's in human form, holy cow. And the angels are so excited, they go to the shepherds and they sing the glory to them and they teach them the glory. Something great and fantastic has happened that's never happened before. God has taken on flesh. Go to Bethlehem and witness it. The salvation of, of man beginning. Once the second person of the Trinity becomes like this, then all of a sudden, now your angel looks at you in a different light. And remember I told you, I've told you this before, your angel looks at you and he sees a replica of Jesus Christ. 
He thinks you look like Jesus, just like God the Father thinks you look like his son. Even if you're a woman, your angel says, I've got this little replica of Jesus that I'm supposed to take care of. Don't I have the greatest job in the universe? And these angels are like, I'm the ninth choir in the third hierarchy. I'm at the bottom of the, of the cow, what do they call it, the pecking order. I'm at the bottom of the pecking order, but I get control of somebody that looks like the second person of the Trinity. It's my job to make sure that they are part of the body of Christ for all of eternity. So now all these guardian angels, they have a function, but they're almost the envy of all of these angels. And to the despise of the devils or the demons that, why does God like this creature more than us? Why does he like this one that's a particle and a soul better than the one that's just a soul? We've been around longer. We'll, we'll never die. We don't have a body that can die. Our souls are eternal. We know everything. They have to learn everything, and then they don't even learn it right. And some of them don't have the capacity to learn anything, and they don't. You know, they drop out of school or something. You know, but but uh, these angels, they're, the body is like anathema to the angels. I think of what the angels look at us like is like what we look at ants like. Yeah. So we look at a bunch of ants, and they all look the same. Yeah. And we wouldn't want to be one. Right. <laughs> but if God had become an ant, then, then the angel's like, wow, holy cow, look what God did with that lowest creature. Right. So like, that's, that's how I look at it. Is, yeah. You know, yeah. From our point of view, we wouldn't want to be an ant, and they all look alike. So looking at it from the angel's point of view, we're like ants. Yeah. But because the second person of the Trinity became man, all of a sudden, they realize that they're going to be, they know what the pecking order of heaven is going to be like. It's God, it's all of humanity, then it's the angels. So right now, remember what that line, we started with that at the beginning of the chapter. She says, Christ is raised above the angels, but for a time he was below the angels. Same thing with Mary. She's purely human, yet she too will be raised above the angels, for she's the mother of, God, of the king. She is by his side as queen, on account of her assumption, body and soul into heaven. She is entirely raised up in glory. The same thing's going to happen with us. We're going to be raised up in glory, and we're going to be above the, the seraphim that are closest to God right now. We're going to be above them. And so now the, these angels are going to say, Nan, Nana, Boo, Boo, I took care of that one. And because I took care of that one and the part of the body of Christ, these angels are going to be right above the seraphim because we're going to speak for them. We're going to say, God, make sure my angel's closest to me to adore you for the rest of eternity. And so now God flips the tables. I tell you, he always does that. He's going to flip the, the, the table on the angels. The lowest are going to become the highest. The highest are going to become the lowest. And that's why Satan is so mad because what is Satan? A seraph angel. And God wanted him to be at the bottom of the totem pole in heaven for all of eternity. He said, I'm not going to do it. I'm second to God. I'm the second angel. I'm the first angel that God ever created. The first thing that this triune God made was Satan. And now you want me to give up my place second to none? To be the lowest at the end of eternity? I won't do it. So what does he want to do? He wants to make sure you stay what you are, dirt, beneath me. And so any of the human beings, if there are any, or if they wind up in hell, those human beings that uh, deny God and his love for them, they'll be believe Satan, and that's what Satan wants. Somebody's got to be below me if I'm going to be number one in my kingdom. i got to have somebody beneath me. What's the king if there's no subjects, right? You can't have a king without subjects. And Satan, he was going to be at the bottom. He was going to be subject to everyone above him. And he said, no, I won't have it. And he convinced all the other demons. And they say that St. Thomas says that they fell from every choir. St. Thomas thought, except from this one, from the lowest. Because those angels said, no way, hold cow. We're going to be the highest of the angels. 
If we're a good guardian angel in God's plan, we're going to be up here. We like that deal. So none of these angels probably defected. But some of the other church fathers, they think there was defection from all of them. But you can't. St. Thomas's reasoning is you can't have an angel, a guardian angel, defect because what happens to that creature, that human being that he was supposed to be in charge of? That would mean that God created a human being that was destined for hell. And God didn't create any of us. All of us are supposed to be up here. He didn't create any of us to be in hell. And so that's why St. Thomas says none of these angels defected. None of them became bad. It was from these other choirs that they defected. And God had most trouble with these guys. And then you'll hear in the, uh, in the Eucharistic prayers, he had trouble with these guys. These are the priestly angels. These are the angels that handle the grace. That's the ones that are going up and down the ladder. It's either the closest to earth, but they're the ones that visit heaven. Father Randy's got a power angel. Jesus Christ, his second angel, his first angel's here, his second angel's from this choir. And uh, this angel, when I say, this is my body, this is my blood, that angel takes as quick as a wink, I raise up that host, he takes the host to heaven, asks the father, there's a priest down there from Sublette, Illinois, 8 o'clock on the Wednesday Mass in Sublette. On Wednesday, he's uh, wanting this bread to turn into the body of your son, Jesus Christ. Will you do it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Quick as he brings it back, and that bread, I set it back down on the patent. It's no longer bread. It's the body of Christ. Same thing with the, with the wine. I raise it. It's wine. I set it back down. It's the blood of Christ. That angel from the power choir took that quick as wink to heaven, brought back the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Brought back the grace of the sacrament. They say that, that God had power, trouble with these power angels because they have handled grace. They're bearers of grace. They're all messengers. What do they do? They bring grace from heaven to earth. So God gave some of the, these power angels grace, and they're like, this is too good for those dirt balls on earth. I'm going to keep it for myself. This is the power of God. This is all his love, all his hope, all his uh, uh, charity, faith, hope, and love. All of them are there. I've got it. It's like they've got like a, uh, a nuclear bomb. All this energy in the grace of, that God gave them, they just run off to their corner of the universe. I've got the essence of God here. I don't want to give it to those human beings. I'll keep it for myself. So God said in the Eucharistic prayer, the church says, God had trouble with these guys. They're, sometimes they're called the host. Remember? Because what's that Eucharist called? It's called the host. Sometimes he says, God had trouble with the host angels. You'll read that in scripture every once in a while. And it's in some of our Eucharistic, uh, Eucharistic prayers too. It says, even the powers tremble at the authority of God. They tremble that the power that they're bringing, the grace that it's not meant for them, but it's meant to make these creatures called human beings greater than themselves. So even powers tremble at the grace that we receive, that God wants to give us. They say, no, I want, I want them to have this grace. I'll take it myself. So they, they, they ran away with it. Okay. So then there's just one funny thing in, uh, in chapter 10. Uh, they just talk about some of the appearances of Our Lady. And they start with the Fatima one in 1917. Yeah. And uh, it's just a funny line. You've got to read this. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, it's just kind of like a dissertation of what happened at each of the uh, things. So here's the Fatima statue. So here's Our Lady Fatima with the three Fatima children, the shepherd children. And they had a vision of, the, uh, of Mary. And uh, let's see, where am I here? Is you have to go to the Bernadette story and the Lords, I think. But uh, if you're in the eighties. Uh huh. I'm trying to find it. Well, the one of the visionaries from uh, from uh, Fatima. You know, she lived to be in her 90s, 
and she she met with Pope John Paul II, and she told him, oh, maybe it's in the other spreadsheet. Oh, yeah, okay. Go to page uh, 78, says uh, Lu Lucia. Indeed, the, the Lucia, the eldest spokesperson of the group, she's talking about the three Fatima children, had asked the lady in the second visit whether they would go to heaven soon. And lady answered, I will take Jacinta and Frances Francesco shortly, but you will stay here for some time to come. Jesus wants to use you to make me known and loved, to establish the devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. When Lucia seemed understandably distressed at being left alone, the lady told her, don't lose heart. I will never forsake you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. Well, she lived almost another 90 years, going finally to join her cousins in the company of Jesus and our beautiful lady, her mother, on her 98th birthday. Okay. Then, here's the beautiful paragraph. So this is, this is why I like this, this woman author. You know, I don't know what it is about me, but I just, I usually don't, you know, like it's, it's Jane Austen's fault. You know, Jane Austen, she just rubs me exactly the wrong way. And she's so tedious with her descriptions. I, 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 wore, I we had to read some of her books for, for literature in high school. And then we had some uh, college class on her too. And it just, she kept rubbing me the wrong way. And I just, she irritates me. And, uh. Then we even had a, semin a seminary professor, and he was giving us a list of books that we should read as priests so we could be well-rounded or something. And he, he has the gall to put Jane Austen in a couple of her works. And I was like, I'm throwing the whole list out because he put, she, he put her on the list. So if you look at my, book, my, uh, my books on my bookshelf, this is never the only book that's written by a woman. It just came on the shelf a month ago. But listen, this is how beautiful this author is. In the years after the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, Lucia did establish devotion to Mary's Immaculate Heart. Even more admirably, in my view, she kept a sense of humor while she did so. A cardinal who visited her when she was 95 recounted, when I told her that I had spoken about Our Lady of Fatima and Lourdes, she remarked, it's a bad idea to confuse Our Ladies. Our Lady of Lourdes, she said, would surely take it amiss that I had spoken of Our Lady of Fatima on her turf, the last secret of Fatima. Good point, Lucia. And yet, what are we to do with all these of Our Ladies, all these visions of Our Ladies? So, you know, she's saying, so she's one of the visionaries, but this, uh, she was talking about in France, uh, at, in Lourdes, she was talking about the Fatima vision. And the people there, they love Our Lady of Lourdes, more than they love Our Lady of Fatima, because it's in their hometown. It's like, you know, if, uh, if Our Lady appeared in Sublette, and then somebody from Maytown came to our town and says, May Our Lady appeared in Maytown, and this is what she told us. We're like, no, we're gonna listen to what Our Lady of Sublette told us, right, right? So see the, 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 uh, the humor that Lucia had. She says, don't talk about Our Lady of Fatima and Lourdes. You know, just keep them separate and let the people have their devotions, you know? So there's all these Our Lady Guadalupe's in Mexico, Our Lady of Lourdes is in France, different part then, in, and Fatima's in Portugal. Uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel is, uh, you know, that's another one, uh, vision that she had to Simon Stock. But Our Lady appears in different places and she has a different message for a different time and a different people. And so it's just like, uh, you know, the title is of the chapter is Our Lady and Our Ladies, plural. And so she's trying to, what do we do with all of these different apparitions? Well, they all have their time and their place and for their people and for their devotion and things. And we just go with it. So, you know, that's the beauty. And then, and then you've got Father Randy confusing the whole situation. And Our Lady Most Admirable's Feast Day is coming up on October 20th and everything. I'll be on retreat, so you'll be scathed this year. You'll be safe from having me you know, have a series of novena masses to Our Lady Most Admirable. But it's just a different spirituality. You know, our mother teaches her children, and I think this is the case. Like, my mom told me different things that she didn't tell my brothers. So that was part of the thing. Like, after, you know, now that mom's been... Uh, pass for a while, you know, we'll each have a different story. And, and my brother would be like, I didn't know mom said that, or I didn't know she did that. She told me different things, but she told them things that she never told me. And so that's what Mary does. She'll tell different, her children, we're all her children, but she doesn't tell us all the same thing. 
because she knows we're unique and she knows what she has to tell us that's best for our salvation, how to listen to her son, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And so that's what these, all these apparitions are. It's for different people in a different time in a different location so that they can grow in holiness. Remember, she's the mother of us all. There's that great joke, you know, uh, Mary and Joseph are trying to decide where they should go on vacation. And uh, Joseph says, you want to go to uh, Guadalupe? No, I've already been there. You want to go to Fatima? No, I've been there. Where do you want to go to Lourdes? No, I've been there too. And he goes, how about Magigori? Yeah, let's go there. Because <laughs> that Magigori hasn't been approved yet. You know, so Mary's like, yeah, I've never appeared there. Let's go there for a vacation. Yeah. So. Don't the Native American Indians say that uh, they think it was Mary that appeared to them? Uh, yeah, so I think that one in Green Bay is the, there's the Marian apparition, and that's the oh, only okay. one that's approved in, uh, in the United States. But there was an apparition up in Wisconsin there. Mm -hmm. What's that town? I don't even remember. Relevant Radio is always having pilgrimages up there. Mm -hmm. Probably won't go sometime, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, she appears all over, you know, and at different times to different people when they need her most. So, you know, uh, you know, she's the mother. She's look, it's a mother that's looking for her children. You know, some of the saints are like the uh, they uh, those visionaries that uh, they talk about their visions of heaven. Uh, they said that uh, when they think about the vision afterwards, they. They never saw Mary. They never see Mary in heaven, and that's because uh, you know this image that she's on Earth. She's still on Earth, helping her children, you and I. And you know we're constantly calling. You know, how many times do we say the Hail Mary a day? You know, fifty as a minimum. You know we're always calling on Mary, so she's always right here. Because you know the mother, moms aren't like you know the kid calls out and the mom ignores him. The mom listens to the kid. The kid calls the mom and says, what do you want? You know, it's not like dad. You, know, you, you, you leave the dad at home, the kids are the, what's the point of having him? He's not doing anything. He won't do anything for us. But mom, she, she's waiting on his hand and foot. Dad's like, get it yourself. You know, but mom's like, she'll do it for us. She, mom always does it this way. I ain't doing that. That's dad. You know? Okay. We can get to that video. <laughs> I thought we'd do the video because then we could eat the stuff. You know? We could, while we're watching, we could be eating. Okay, so we'll have to do that next time. We'll just start with the with the Creed uh, video. I didn't like the first uh, video. It's like 45 minutes. The rest are about like 50 or something. Uh, it's like there's nuggets in everything. Like, just like, like I'm saying. You know, some things you like, some things you don't. Some things you heard before, some things you didn't. Uh, there's like that's in the video, so there, you'll find some nuggets in there, and maybe maybe all of it'll be new to you. But Father uh, Bishop Barron goes through with this uh, creed series. He goes through all of the parts of the creed in six six videos, and so the first part is uh, is just on God the Father. I believe in one God. He just talks about that one line, and then the second line is uh, the Father Almighty. Then he goes to to Jesus. And then he goes to the Passion of Christ in the fourth volume. So uh, he just going to work through the elements of the creed, and they have a lot of video. So it's not just him talking; they flash around and show you different scenes. And you know, it's not like they have uh, special effects. So it's kind of like a, more like that Mother Teresa movie. So we went to that Mother Teresa movie. You know, there was no special effects at all. It was like. Ugh. <laughs> it's just a documentary, and I heard most of it already, the quotes and things. So, you know, I didn't like as much as the other zealots that went up with us. But, you know, uh, you know, looking around and everybody's like this, we're wide-eyed and everything. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, we bought these sodas. Just, just the sodas, you could barely get your hand on the bottom of the thing. It was like over a liter, stuff like a gallon of liquid. <laughs> and, and then we had these big things of popcorn, so we go in there. And uh, Mark Lauer's sitting next to me, and he's like, Father, I feel terrible. There's all these emaciated people in the video because she's serving the poor in Calcutta. And here I am with this big bowl of popcorn. I'm like, no, you got the wrong idea. Mother Teresa fed those that were hungry. Just every time they say that, just take a mother handful of popcorn and eat it. I said, that's what I'm doing with this drink. There's no way I'm going to finish this. Every time they said, 
Mother Trick gave drink to the thirsty, I would take a sip of soda. And then uh, when they had, you know, they had all, all the convents that are missionaries of charity, they have the cross and they sit right next to the crucifix, right next to the wounded side, I thirst. Every time I saw that, I'd take another sip. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I got through half of that. I wouldn't even finish that much soda. I didn't drink that much soda. But I just it was a reminder to, you know, to drink and to eat because, you know, you fast and you feast. But, you know, it was a, it was a good movie. And Mark said that uh, the Knights of Columbus might try to get a copy and then we could show it here at the hall or something. So then we won't have to go all the way up there and stumble around in the dark. Poor Pauline, we made her, we put her first and made her go all the way up the stairs and then all the way to the end of the pew, I mean, end of the seats, you know. Instead of her last and then she would have had to sit right at the end, we made her go first and all, she had to walk the furthest. She had the most trouble walking. It was terrible. But we survived, huh? Yeah, we did. So, it was, it was a good movie. Uh, there were some parts with John Paul II in it. Uh, they, they had some actual footage, and they showed a lot of, a uh, couple of, like splices of interviews with Mother Teresa herself. So it was good to hear her voice, and you know, you forget how uh, husky John Paul's voice was, oh. you know, in that thick Polish accent when he's speaking English, it's still coming out. And so Mother Teresa was introducing her to some of the sisters, and so he's trying to repeat the names to learn them and everything, and trying to figure out where, she's telling them where they're from and everything, too. He's trying to say, oh, your sister so-and-so from, from Argentina? Yes, yes, Holy Father. <laughs> okay, I pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they had some nice footage that I'd never seen before, but, you know, most of it was. And I learned about that miracle with them, the miracle for her canonization, the second miracle, I hadn't heard that story of that man before. So uh, so there were some new things in it, even for me. But but we'll try to get it here. If the Knights can get a copy, we'll just show it here then. Nice. So maybe, yeah. We'll have coffee instead of uh, soda and <laughs> stay awake. Not big things, OK? Uh, let's just pray the prayer to a loving God so we won't have uh, any more meetings. In October, next week I'm on uh, on retreat, and then the week after is the finance council from Sublet on that Tuesday night. So we won't have it until November. But I'm looking at November, I think. Is it All Saints? Yeah, we probably won't have it on. We'll probably have to have something on. Maybe we'll try like a Thursday night or something, because oh. uh, Tuesday won't work, because that first week of November either. So it'd be like three weeks until we get something. So maybe we'll try something on a Thursday or something, huh? Mm -hmm. A look, maybe it could be the last Thursday in October, oh. the 27th, or uh, maybe the first Thursday in uh, November, just so we get something. And it's not a four month, a four week thing before we get another one. Okay. But uh, let's pray the prayer to a loving God, and then I'll give you a blessing. We'll, we'll disperse. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And your spirit. We pray together. Loving God, may you see in us nothing that you have not given to us. Make our bodies healthy and agile, our minds sharp and clear, our hearts joyful and contented, our souls faithful and loving, our eyes keen to see your love for us, and surround us with the company of angels and saints who share our devotion to you. Above all, let us live in your presence. For with you, all fear is banished, and there is only harmony and peace. Let every day combine the beauty of spring, the brightness of summer, the abundance of autumn, and the repose of winter. And at the end of our life on earth, grant that we may come to see and to know you in the fullness of your glory. And the Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God's blessing come down upon you and those that you love in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ to love and serve our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Assumption. Pray for us. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Pray for us. St. Patrick. Pray for us. And Pope St. John the 23rd. Pray for us. Thank you.